And we, we are lucky once in a while to welcome people like Amy and Chef Donald from Guitar Chocolates. Um, Amy is a fifth generation uh, chocolate manufacturer. Um, she is the great, 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 great <laughs> granddaughter of Etienne Guitard, who came from France uh, during the gold rush days, um, like many of our forebears. Um, but when he saw how the gold miners had the money to buy good chocolate, he went back to France and learned about chocolate and brought it back here. And, and I would say, for good chocolate like this, I would pay almost the price of gold. <laughs> so this is what you're going to learn today. And this is guitar chocolate, not the other chocolate that, that begins with a G, that um, tourists flock to, that has a kind of Italian-sounding name. This is French. <laughs> and, and this is the chocolate I love to cook with. And it's so good to know that it's American-made and American-based. <clears throat> So, um, Chef is the chef of Guitard. He's based in Los Angeles uh, and, and teaches professionals as well as non-professionals about the ins and out of chocolate. Amy has a book where she really writes about this. She came back from working with Cliff Bars to, to what she knew and loved, uh, which is chocolates. And so I'm gonna hand it over to her. Um, chocolate is an incredibly deep and interesting subject. Um, I don't know if some of you know that in the raw food movement, chocolate is considered a superfood, right? It's got these incredible uh, antioxidants and, and list of nutrients. So that's your excuse, guys. But keep it easy on the sugar. Um, and I also know that when I was studying pastries and desserts in France that uh, when it came to chocolate, we were handed a sheaf of papers this thick. You probably did, I know you did. And, and you're tested specifically on your knowledge of chocolate and temperatures and how to handle it and how finicky it can be. Mm -hmm. So without much ado, um, very much happy to have you here and welcome and I'll hand Thank this to you. you. Thanks. Uh, we're so, thanks for the introduction. Um, thank you all for coming. I know you guys are all super, super busy, but um, we're stoked to be here and um, to share a little bit about Guitard um, and also to dive into um, the nuances of chocolate. Um, as alluded to earlier, chocolate is super complex and there's a lot of different ways and things that you can dive into when you're starting to learn about it, when you're baking with it. Um, and so what we did is we picked um, two recipes from the book. Um, Donald has a chapter in the back of it that have a little bit more sophisticated recipes. So he's going to be testing two of those um, today and we selected those recipes primarily because they showcase a variety of different chocolates that go into different flavor nuances and also different applications. We've pulled a selection of items. We make probably what, like 250 items maybe? Yeah, 250. Uh, more or less. We have a collection at TN line which is geared primarily to um, professional pastry chefs. A lot of those items are also available for consumers but we pulled a selection of those here which you guys can taste after um, we do the demo and it's basically just to showcase the different types of chocolate, whether it's a chip, a wafer, or a bar. Um, there's some fun stuff over here between like a 70 and a 72, which are seemingly very close together because the percentages are the same, but they couldn't taste more different. So um, kind of jumping ahead here, but I wanted you guys to sort of have that as a foundation to help you navigate as we talk through the recipes to know that there's this sort of diversity of products um, over here that you'll be able to explore once we finish. Um, and as mentioned, I am the fifth generation of my family business, which was started in 1868 in San Francisco. Um, we were making chocolate in the Bay Area that whole time. When we first opened, we were doing coffees, teas, and spices um, in addition to uh, chocolate, because chocolate, we often talk about in the industry, is that it's a grinding business. You start off with a bean, you grind it down, and you make um, a cocoa powder, you can make um, ground liquor, which is uh, unsweetened chocolate, which is an oftentimes a base for a lot of recipes. Um, but it's a grinding business. It wasn't until after the 06 earthquake in San Francisco, which everyone's probably familiar with, where we consolidated down just to making chocolate. So um, we've been doing that for a whole bunch of years. Um, and most of what we do at Guitard is... Um, 
you know, we make chocolate, um, but we do it in a way that sort of marries the tradition of our business and the tradition and heritage of chocolate in general because it has such a rich, rich history with innovation because it's so, the, the industry, as everyone who here probably here knows, is so highly saturated right now. There are all these bean to bar guys um, and, you know, everyone has their own way of making chocolate. Um, and so what we do is always looking for different ways that consumers are engaging with chocolate, new recipes that chefs are coming out with. That's a really important part of what Donald does. Um, different ways that we can make chocolate in our factory. Um, and most importantly, we're always looking for new beans. And that's a really big part. Uh, you can't talk about making chocolate without talking about the raw ingredient. Um, it's not a great photo, but I brought some pamphlets that are over here you guys can look at. But cocoa is a bean. It's a fruit. I always tell people that you're, I start eating chocolate at like 9 a.m. anyway, but you're getting your fruits and vegetables by eating a fruit. Um, but it starts <coughs> off as a fruit. Um, it's a bean. Uh, it's a seed, actually. Um, this is a dried cocoa pod, um, and I'll leave this out for you guys to look at. It grows on a tree. Um, farmers grows 15 to 20 degrees either side of the equator, um, what we call the cocoa belt. And we source beans from all over the world. We do single origins, we do blends. Um, each region has a ver their own sort of flavor profile, which is also really important to how you make chocolate and what goes into either creating a recipe and selecting the chocolate, um, what happens on the farm level, the fermentation and drying process, again, is really, really crucial component to getting the right flavor. So it's not only the terroir, it's not only the genetics of the bean, like a Brayburn versus a Pink Lady versus a Granny Smith apple. Um, you've got similar types of things with regards to a cocoa pod. Um, and there you have Trinitario, Forestero, um, Criollo, all sorts of different types. So it's that, but it's also what the farmer does with the bean at origin um, before it even comes to us. And then we like to say we try and listen to what, how the bean wants to be roasted and treated once we start making chocolate from it. And then it works its way through, through our factory. Um, and then gets in the hands of chefs like Donald, um, who then tastes the chocolate, figure out sort of the nuanced flavors, and then has an ability to then craft a recipe um, that can kind of celebrate those flavors that really starts on the farm, goes through a factory, and ends up in a kitchen. So I'm going to hand it over to Donald. Um, there'll be time afterwards, I believe, for questions. Um, and yeah, so he's going to do two recipes, as I said, that <coughs> showcase different types of, of chocolates. And I'll probably jump in and ad lib as we go. Great. Thanks everyone for coming. So we're gonna start by making a chocolate pound cake. Um, it's, a, it's a five meal a day kind of a recipe. You can have it for breakfast, lunch, tea, dinner, midnight <laughs> snack. So I'm gonna start off with some, some uh, butter. What's critical about all pound cakes, not just um, um, chocolate pound cakes, is that all the ingredients are at room temperature um, for the physics of mixing. So I'm gonna go ahead and add sugar, a little bit of honey and butter to this. Gonna get a little noisy for a minute. And I'm gonna aerate this. This is the creaming method uh, we talk about in baking. So I'm gonna cream the butter. Uh, I'm gonna introduce a lot of air cells that are gonna um, improve the texture or actually create the texture for the cake. We're also gonna add some egg and whip that in. That's, gonna add, that's also gonna um, add some air to it. And we're also gonna use just a little bit of leavening, a little tiny bit of baking powder. So three ways I'm trying to get um, cell structure uh, and lift for this pound cake so it's not dense and heavy. And we are gonna try this today, by the way. So while that's whipping, gonna give it about maybe 90 seconds to two minutes. Um, I have my dry ingredients here. I need to sift those together. Cocoa powder, I'm using our cocoa rouge, which is this uh, red can over here. You can have a look at it. Um, it's 22%, uh, 24% fat cocoa powder, which is kind of standard for baking recipes. Um, so to incorporate, I'm just sifting these ingredients. Salt. So that's so sifting is to aerate. It's also to uh, incorporate things. So I do it on paper. A little final mixing. So that's ready to go. Going to go ahead and add in our eggs. So this eggs are room temperature. Jeff, why is it important to have ingredients at room temperature? Well, so 
first of all, the butter will whip up nice and light. If I dump a cold egg onto that, all, all that air I put into it, it's gonna, it's gonna actually cause the butter to chill down. So all my air is gonna go away. Um, so right now I've got a light. Can y'all see in there? Is there a way to see in there? Sort of? How about if I do, no? <laughs> no, all right. We'll leave it like that. I'm gonna stop the bowl for a second because it's almost ready to go anyway. That way you can kind of see it. So it's light and lemon yellowish. Very important. Ooh. So, yeah, it's, it's very light. So um, I'm just going to give it a little bit of a scrape here. Fortunately, this paddle attachment we have in this mixer does a really nice job of scraping, so I don't have to do that much. But you do want to scrape often. But the machine has really been helpful. What's that? Sugar this is sugar and butter and a little, little bit of honey. Yeah. And so over here, we've got um, all-purpose flour cocoa powder, a little pinch of salt, and a tiny bit of baking powder. And now we're going to add um, our dry and our liquids together. So I've got a little bit of coffee and vanilla extract. I've got some buttermilk. And we're going to incorporate the dry and the wets together. You've probably read recipes where it says alternate dry and wet. What's that all about? So if I were to dump all the liquids in, the butter fat would separate, wouldn't be able to absorb this liquid. If I put all the flour in and kept mixing, it would toughen up our structure. We wouldn't have a nice light cake. So that's why you want to alternate. So I'm going to start off with a little bit of flour. So I like to, I like to use this method of getting stuff into the bowl. It's a lot cleaner than trying to use a spoon or dump it out of a scoop or something. So a little bit of our, our dry, a little splash of our wet. Just a note on that cocoa powder, it's a Dutch cocoa powder. You guys probably see on shelf that there's sometimes natural cocoa powders, Dutch cocoa powder. Um, Dutch cocoa powder is oftentimes something that I describe as like it has like a Moorish, <laughs> which is a funny, it's like you want more of it. It's like that Oreo cookie flavor um, and it's processed with, uh, it's like alkalized, so it's a sodium bicarbonate. Um, and so it gives a very different flavor note than like a natural cocoa powder. Um, and you've got to adjust your recipe if you're using natural in lieu of a Dutch just because it's got additives in there. Right, Donald? Yes, that's right. And how you adjust that is by adding some baking soda, bicarbonate soda. So you change the pH of the cocoa powder. Um, so a little bit more mixing. I'm gonna use my final amount of dry. So now our cake is essentially mixed. Off the machine. And I'll do a little final folding together here. So now, this is kind of the, when I set out to make this recipe, I wanted to create a cake that wasn't just all cocoa powder based. And I wanted to add more chocolate flavor. So what I did is I, I grated our 91%, which you can taste over here, on a box grater. Just simple box grater like this. And then I'm going to fold this in. So it'll be just another little shot of chocolate in there. So um, just, again, trying to push the chocolate flavor forward in cake. Sometimes you see pound cakes that are really shiny and dark. Those are always made with oil um, and just cocoa powder. But I wanted a true chocolate flavor in here. So we'll taste it later, and you can see what, what I'm talking about. So when, um, something that's really important about working with chocolate is understanding what percentage is. And so like a... The cocoa nib, which we don't have any here, unfortunately. Do you have any in your recipes? I can't remember. I do not today, you don't. no. So cocoa nib is basically the, the roasted cocoa bean before it's ground down. The cocoa nib is more or less 50% fat, 50% solid. Um, and so when you're looking at a percentage, percent cacao, you can sort of try and figure out that it's, it's um, the percentage is representative of the cocoa mass. The remaining percentage is typically sugar. If it's a milk chocolate, it's sugar and milk added to it. You can kind of sort of figure figure out from that the difference between the, the fats and the solids. Sometimes you add cocoa butter in, which is the sign of a couverture. Um, the 91 has added cocoa butter in it. Uh, if you don't add cocoa butter, it's going to be a different sort of rheology. So this 72% does not have added cocoa butter in it. So the, the fat content is more or less, uh, what would that be, uh, 30, no. It's, on, it's about 30, about 35, yeah. Okay, thanks. And then the 70 has added cocoa butter in it. So it's just something to keep in mind as, you, as you're working with chocolate. And then I'll add on to that once Donald goes through his next. 
All right, so that's what our batter looks like. Um, I got these cute little pans, they're half pound loaf pans. You can bake it in a bigger pan, that's okay, but these are so adorable, I thought I would use those. Um, so getting this into the pan without getting it all over the table, a couple of ways, a scraper works. I like a nice cream scoop, that's really helpful. You can kind of drop it in. We'll fill the pans up about two thirds of the way. Um, so, I, spray, I, I sprayed um, a little bit of pan spray in here, or you can use butter. What, what was the question? Oh, the question was, she's asking what's the, the difference between spraying and using parchment paper. I use both. So, I want it coming out. I don't want any, 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 any chance for it not to come out. So, um, I put a little spray in there, which attaches the paper to the pan, actually. And then push the paper in, now it stays. And then we put a little spray on top. So, it just, it just helps. Uh, it could be butter also, or oil. All right, so a couple methods of getting it into the pan. Okay, I'll just use this little guy here just to kind of smooth them out a bit. Give it a tap, that'll knock any air cells that are stuck in there, in little pockets. Okay, so those are ready to go. I'm just gonna lose these over this way, please, thank you. Um, we're gonna make a little topping for it. So it's done real quickly in a food processor. Move this out of the way, thank you. Okay, so food processor. So I've got Damara sugar, which is like a, an unrefined brown sugar. It's got a little more molasses in it. Cocoa powder again, our cocoa rouge. Um, some roasted hazelnuts. All purpose flour. Little pinch of salt. So what I'm gonna do is go ahead and drop the sugar in here first. Cocoa powder, flour. Whoops, made a little mess there. If I'd used my paper method, it wouldn't be all over the table now. All right, so just gonna combine these ingredients together. Now I'm gonna go ahead and pulse in these hazelnuts. And roasting hazelnuts twice is a, a practice that I've always had. Um, hazelnuts gain more flavor by roasting them two times. In, in a crumble like this situation that's surrounded by fat, all the moisture coming out the cake, the hazelnuts won't cook. So they'll be kind of rawish. Um, Break those guys up. I think we'll start our second recipe, which is going to be a cookie. It's a triple chocolate cookie recipe. Forgot that, that's salt. All right, triple chocolate cookies. So I've melted chocolate. There's two kinds of chocolate. There's a 100% there's a and a 64% in butter. So. On melting chocolate, I use a water bath occasionally. I can also use a microwave. You can melt the butter separately from the chocolate. Combine the two, you can melt them both together. The point is getting them melted and then homogenous. So we're just gonna stir these two together, or these three things together rather. So there's 100%, 64, and some unsalted butter here. Okay, I've got some eggs. Sugar. We're gonna give a little bit of air to this, about, about one minute of whipping at high speed. Donald, do you wanna talk a little bit about how you work with um, like new chocolates and develop recipes around new Vanilla? chocolates? Vanilla, uh, yes. So when I get a new chocolate from Guitar, I'll taste it first against a bunch of things that I might have in the kitchen. I'll taste it with fruit, I'll taste it with coffee, I might just, um, 
eat it with some sour cream. I just like have a little, little panel of different kinds of ingredients in the kitchen and sort of see what jumps out when I'm tasting it. Passion fruit, perhaps. Um, what else? Nut products. And sort of see if there's any inherent uh, traits in the chocolate that kind of correspond nicely with this particular chocolate. So I'm always looking for pairings that way. And um, just sort of, and then I'll mess around with the rheology of it. I'll see how it melts. I'll see how it handles on the table. Then I'll see how it, it folds into, into ingredients and just sort of check, check it out that way. And that's how I come up with, with new things. I mean, I think when we sit around the table at the office and try and develop new flavor profiles, it usually starts with the beans that we get from, we've got really strong relationships with farmers all over the world, and it's a very word of mouth community, so we'll get an email or a phone call from a, from a farmer, they'll come up to us at a trade show and hand us a bag of samples and say, can you make chocolate out of this and tell me what you think, um, which is what we love to do. And it's that dialogue and that relationship with these farmers that sort of leads us to developing a lot of these um, chocolates that Don Donald is saying kind of is, inspires him to develop these new recipes and you know I think one of the things when you're baking with chocolate is getting familiar with the different flavor profiles and allowing yourself sort of the freedom a lot of the recipes in our cookbook are basic enough that you can be like okay so now I know how to make a regular old chocolate chip cookie let me switch it up a little bit and maybe use a single origin Madagascar because I know it's got some cranberry notes in it and I want to toss in some dried cranberries in that and you know spruce it up a little so having that sort of language and, and being comfortable enough to be able to do that in the kitchen comes with sort of an understanding of flavor. Exactly. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm going to uh, just sift this um, flour and a little bit of salt together again for this recipe. Okay. It'll also make it easy to get in there. So we'll put this on hold for just a minute. So our, our three components for the cookie is the melted chocolate butter mixture our aerated eggs and sugar, and then our flour, okay? Now, I'm gonna cut this butter up into little cubes. Chef, do you prefer a special butter? I like unsalted butter um, in all my recipes. Usually it's like 82%. Um, can be a little lower. So, I'm just gonna pulse these guys together. Eighty-two percent fat. Eighty-two percent fat. Yeah, that's kind of European style. What's cold the butter. Question? Yeah. Yes. If I do use um, if I use soft butter, it would kind of be a greasy sort of um, consistency, and we definitely don't want that for streusel. So you're looking for a coarse, crumbly mixture? Coarse, crumbly. I, I should be able to grab it with my hand, and it'll, yeah. it'll clump together. <laughs> it's like, what are you doing to me? What am I doing to it? <laughs> There's a piece of butter trying to get down in the bottom. We'll get it down in there. We're going to push it down, actually. There we go. All right. Perfect. All right, we're gonna massage it into this bag here. Um, I do this. Get a piece of paper. So as you can see, it kind of sticks together. So I'll just mix a little bit by hand here. We'll put some into this bag. Now you can use it this way straight away, but I'm just gonna show you a quick technique. Well, let's just do one this way. So here's our crumble topping, easy way. I'll show you a different way, an alternative way to do it. I press it into a, a sheet, like so, then I refrigerate it, um, keep it ready to go. Get that out of the way. And then it's just kind of ready. I, I keep a lot of doughs this way, um, prepared, they're sealed. 
freeze it? I freeze it. Yeah, I can freeze it or refrigerate it. And then what I'm going to do is going to press it through a screen, and I can create a little crumb this way. Get rid of that. Thank you. And then you can kind of just kind of press it through, either with a rolling pin or even with your hand. And it wasn't cold enough. <laughs> My little makeshift fridge. But anyway, you can press it through and you end up with these nice little uniform crumbs like that. All right. Chef, this is there assuming you, you have leftovers, right? Assuming you have leftovers, right. assuming. Uh, not in my kitchen, no, it wouldn't be. All right, so we're gonna use a few of these just for our cake, our other cake. But they're, they're kind of uniform, That's little crumbs. That's beautiful. All right, so those are gonna go in the oven. Right down here. 350, about 30 minutes. I say about because all ovens are, tend to be a little bit different. So we'll watch 30 minutes on that, Do you time on that. All right, so back to the cookie. So, again, review. So, our butter and chocolate mixture. It's gonna go right into this, this egg, egg sugar emulsion. There we go. Fold that together. followed by our dry mix. And then I'm gonna fold in some milk chocolate wafers, hence the triple chocolate. Is that the 38%? That's the 38%, so in here, so it's the 100%, the 64, and this 38% milk. And then I'm gonna pour it onto this sheet pan and chill it. And then if you take a piece of paper and just kind of fold this up, spread it out a little bit. And now you've got a top for it, so now it's completely sealed. So in the refrigerator that goes, so it's cold, maybe a maybe half hour, maybe, maybe oh. longer. Or it could be tomorrow. Um, then what that looks like when it's all done is this. So it's, it's chilled dough now. And what I'm going for is to end up with something that looks like this in the end. So these are kind of ready to go. So it's a, it's a stick of cookie dough, and now there's the paper that we're going to bake it on, so it's, it's not, not wasted. Thank you. A little flour on the board, so this is how I'm going to end up with this particular piece. Paper goes away. A bit of flour. I'll just cut them into bars. Let me add this one in. Just don't have any empty spaces. <clears throat> so I give it a little squeeze. Get the shape started. And that's, and that's how that works. So on the paper it goes, you wrap it up and roll it. So now, now you've got the cookie, which you can freeze, you can refrigerate, um, refrigerate a couple of weeks, freeze a couple of months, um, nice to have them on hand. 
Any questions about that process? It's kind of simple, right? Chef, thank you. Right. I, sure. I always forget how much work it is to make pastries. Um, this is why I'm no longer in pastries. <laughs> um, are there any oh, no, questions? It's, it's, it's easy. Thank you so much. Sure. sure. Are we going to get a taste of uh, We are. Um, there are now? pound cakes over there. Uh, everyone's got a plate. Is that what it is? Should we taste it now, do you think? Any questions? What is the advantage of like using 100 and then 64 as opposed to like something in the middle? Okay, so um, this is a really intensive um, flavored cookie. So I'm using the 100%. I'm, I'm controlling the amount of sugar that goes along with that. Because like in a 64%, 36% of that's going to be sugar. So I've added, I've added um, a blend of these chocolates together just to kind of create this nice strong flavor that you're going to taste in a minute. If I had used chocolate that had sugar already in it, it would be really sweet and kind of cloying and not dark and rich like this cookie is. So you're really controlling the taste effect yes. that you want. Yeah. I'm controlling the taste effect. I'm controlling um, the flavors. Um, I'm blending two kinds of chocolate together and then in adding an inclusion, which is milk chocolate. So coming back to the inclusion, so let's say you don't want to put milk chocolate in. That, that inclusion part that I f folded in at the end is, it, it could be anything. It could be white chocolate, it could be dark chocolate, it could be milk chocolate, it could be nuts if you wanted to. The, the base cookie recipe that you'll find in the book is what is what you need to create this. Um, any, anyway, the inclusions can be up to you. You can be creative about that. This is amazing. Um, yeah. uh, this is amazing. <laughs> the books are, it, it's in the book, right? It is in the book. Recipes yeah. are in the book. Yeah. How's the chocolate tasting? Um, so we, we can ask more technical questions about the, the, uh, the how to make but I wanted to ask Amy, you're, you're the generation who's brought sustainability back into, into your business. And you were talking so lovingly and knowingly about the farmers that you deal with. Do you want to tell us what you've done and why the, the cacao growing and, and sustainability is, yeah. is making such a difference? Yeah, I mean, I think... Um I, I, would, I wouldn't go as far as to say that I brought sustainability to Guitard because one of the things that was so humbling about coming to the, the family business after not working there for a while was sort of um, realizing that all the stuff we've done without really talking about it. Uh, my grandfather used to go to Origin and relationships is such a crucial part of what we do um, and really realizing that that was just inherently how we do business, which was pretty awesome um, and humbling again. So what we've been doing is working um, to try and articulate what what those relationships mean and what they look like. We go to Origin. I go to Origin all the time um, with our director of sustainability, as does my dad. Um, and one of the sort of pivotal points of what we do at Origin is talking to farmers about flavor. Um, you'll oftentimes hear how important yields are. How oh, you know you got farmers need more cocoa because with more cocoa they can get more money. But what you don't realize is that you also have to take into account what the flavor is because. Um, with, with just a constant onslaught of, of high yielding plants, it's oftentimes at the detriment of flavor and you don't have this beautiful, nuanced, balanced flavor that's so important to making good chocolate, um, which is also important to creating a sustainable supply chain. I think we so oftentimes think about sustainability in terms of programs on the ground or things like that, but it's also about creating, putting in place systems that create for long-term um, success and longevity um, for a product. So, um, you know, we talk about flavor, we talk about relationships, we do a lot of programs on the ground, women's empowerment stuff, um, helping towards um, child protection initiatives in West Africa, which is a really big, um, very challenging um, cultural thing that happens uh, over there. And um, yeah, so. Do you... Um want to give us a quick guide to how to taste the chocolates you've put out, where, what the origins are? And sure. Yeah, we didn't bring our single origins, which in hindsight would have been fun for you guys to taste, but maybe I'll send them down and you, can, you guys can do a sample again at another time. But um, we selected the products that Donald is using in his recipes because it's fun, and I totally nerd out about this stuff, but it's fun to taste the chocolate as itself and sort of close your eyes and envision sort of as Donald was talking about what he does when he's trying to develop a recipe. Taste the chocolate, and then if you haven't already finished your plates, which it looks like most of you have, um, try and taste the chocolate against the finished dessert. Um, but I pulled the 70 and the 72, neither of which are included in the recipes, but again, it's just a fun point of comparison. Um, the 72 is an origin, it's a blend, both of those are blends, um, 
the 70 is a little bit more of a French style, a little bit more peaky, um, fruity. The 72 is what, again, we call Moorish. Um, you kind of want more of it. Um, there's like sipping chocolates, which are oftentimes more of the single origins where you can only take a little bit and it's to savor it. Um, and then the Moorish is sometimes has like, uh, like, you know, it's more of a Dutch note. Um, but the 72 uh, doesn't have any Dutching in it, but it's um, made from beans, primarily from beans out of West Africa, which is, um, has a very coconutty flavor. So when you taste them side by side, you'll be able to pick up on that. Um, I also pulled the 38 and the 45, both of which are milk chocolates, but again, total different opposites of the spectrum. The 38 is more of a fresh dairy note, uh, more of a, an American style milk chocolate. The 45 has more of like a sour dairy note to it. So it's a little bit more of like a French style. Um, and then we have the 63% um, chip. And we didn't quite get to this, but um, when you guys are baking, if you're looking through the cookbook, you'll see that there's some recipes that call for wafers, some that call for baking chips. The easiest way that I can sort of describe the difference, you can make a chocolate chip cookie with both, is the baking chip um, oftentimes serves as like an architectural structure. It's got less cocoa butter in it, so it's gonna hold up your cookie. Whereas if you bake a cookie with baking wafers, they have there's more cocoa butter in it, that's why it's flatter. So when you bake a cookie with it, it's gonna be like a little bit of a flatter cookie. It's to be a little bit oozier. Um, so I put that out there just for fun. Not that you don't know what a baking chip looks like, but it's there. Um, and then the 100%, if you're daring, go for it. Um, it's super palatable for 100%. Um, doesn't have any sugar in it. Uh, the original energy bar as I like to say, um, and the 91, and then the 64, and then we have the Coca Rouge out, just so you can see that really beautiful red color, which comes from the beans, um, and that's a Dutch powder as well. So, Donald, do yeah. you have a favorite, a cook's point of view about what they're going to um, taste? I, gosh, that's a hard question <laughs> because I use so many of them for so many different reasons. Um, again, bl I like to blend them. I like so to blend chocolate. You use the 100% and the 60. 64 and the 38 in that cookie. In I use Coco Rouge and the 91% in the pound cake. Really interesting. Yeah, so it's, okay. I like to combine them. Okay, yeah. great. Hi. A uh, question about fondue. Um, of all the, the ones that you just described, which ones would you recommend the most if somebody wants to make a chocolate fondue? A like chocolate fondue. Fruits, like strawberries chocolate in it. Fondue. Well, chocolate fondue, um, are you talking about mixing it with cream or just straight chocolate? Just, from, just straight chocolate? I, I think I would use the 70% over there. Yeah, I would. I would mix it with cream. You should mix it with cream. But it, it, yeah, also, you know. They're fine. Yeah, also good. Oops, I was just curious, uh, in your pamphlet it says that you work with governments to help with uh, the rights of the chocolate makers. How does that relationship look like? So what governments in terms of local governments at origin. So um, cocoa is one of the biggest sort of commodities for a lot of these countries that are growing it. Um, and the government is oftentimes regulates what, regulates the price um, and regulates sort of the inputs that they get, whether it's fertilizers, planting materials, things like that. It's heavily, heavily regulated, which is a good thing um, because a lot of these farmers are living out in the boonies and they don't have access to things. Um, a lot of the roads are really bad. So when the government's involved, it's good. Um, but it's oftentimes, um, when you work in collaboration with them, it sort of affords an opportunity for different sorts of perspectives to be shared and understood. For instance, flavor is something that they don't necessarily realize. Like, like there's a disconnect between the importance of flavor and how that impacts price on the, cocoa's traded on the futures market, so it impacts price, it impacts um, sort of the, the long-term, long, you know, perspective of the cocoa plant itself. And so that's just one example of how working in collaboration with government sort of brings additional perspective about how they can aid farmers and sort of um, for us it's more about capacity building so with knowledge and with that sort of dialogue can create sort of long-term success that's owned by the countries themselves rather than just coming in and saying like oh plant this um, one of the things that we do in Ghana is we have flavor labs that's in conjunction with the um, Cocoa Research Institute of Ghana, CRIG, um, which they have huge resources available. And so we instituted a flavor lab there to allow them, give them the tools so they know how to taste. So the planting materials that they're getting in, they can figure out whether it's something that they actually want to plant and hand out to farmers rather than just knowing that it's a high yielding plant. They came to our office, a bunch of scientists, Ghanaian scientists came to our office and spent 
like a week with us in our lab um, learning how to taste, which is continued from all the work that they've been doing. And that's a USAID program that we do. Um, we're doing a similar thing in Indonesia because um, they have a really beautiful cocoa bean that is um, not to belabor it, but but it's um, in Indonesia they harvest during the rainy season. So when they're drying in the sun, the, the beans oftentimes um, get too much moisture, and so they'll dry them near a fire, which gives a smoky flavor, which is not good for cocoa. So if you guys have like smoky, if you see a bar that says like the inherent coke or smoky notes of a cocoa bean, that's them trying to like <laughs> uh, hide the fact that they're getting beans that are tainted with smoke because you don't want smoke in your beans. But anyway, so we're working with Indonesian government to sort of implement a similar program in Ghana um, to what we did in Ghana. So Chef Liv mentioned that um, chocolate is, you know, seen as like a superfood. Have you seen any changes in recent years with like market interest or customer demand for like products as like the whole like raw food revolution, everything has been occurring? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the trends in food is that there's always this sort of like, how can we eat delicacies and like indulgent foods and feel okay about it? And I think, the, I mean, the, the truth around the antioxidants things is that yes, this is chocolate is, has like inherent properties that are good for you. Um, in terms of like new trends and things like that, not so much by way of antioxidants. I mean, I think you can look at it at the marketplace and you'll see that there's an in, increased interest in like raw foods. Um, I get really nervous about about raw cacao, I, I, I mean, I'll eat nibs and I eat stuff on the farm, but um, I think that might just be because my stomach's somewhat tough, knock on wood. Um, but I always try, I mean, the, the raw chocolate movement, uh, it's like a little concerning to me because there's so many like just icky things in, a, in the bean that, that um, comes out when you're roasting it. Um, but I think the biggest trend that I see right now is organic, at least in the chocolate chocolate space. I don't know how you feel about that since you see it from a different side of things. Yeah, if I can just circle back on the raw chocolate thing just real quick. Oh, yeah. So cacao is, is heaped in one meter square boxes, gen generally speaking, and fermented. So it's, it's, in, it's, it's in the jungle area. Then it's dried on a concrete patio in the sun. And then it's put into a burlap bag. And then, it's, and then it gets to the factory where it has, could have like foreign objects like rocks and things in it and whatever. So we spend a lot of time cleaning it before we put it through the machinery. So if you can imagine it being heaped and fermented and then dried in a concrete patio, the, the pathogen level can be quite s substantial. So when you just pop cocoa beans in your mouth raw, I don't know, <laughs> maybe, maybe, maybe not. I don't do it. I, I won't do it. I'm you're, you're tough. I, I would never well, no, do that. I've, no. I've had my yeah. fair share of so, challenges. So that, that's, I just wanted to explain how that happens and how that looks. Um, and as Amy said, a lot, of, a lot of what we get in the bean quality has to do with what happens at the farm and the fermentation and drying process are critical. I mean, Huge. without that being done correctly, um, the beans don't, don't have a chance. So. I mean, that's another thing we do at Origin is work with farmers. We'll have them send us beans um, every... I mean, I just came back from, um, anyway, I go to a bunch of trade shows and I'll, I'll like bring beans back for me. I'm like, this came from Cameroon. And we'll do a test run um, of the beans. And if we can taste that they've, they've been pro uh, improperly fermented, which isn't necessarily a government thing, but if they've been improperly fermented or not dried properly, um, we'll give that feedback to the farmers and allow them to sort of have, an, again, have a dialogue and kind of get them on the right path because it's so such a crucial component. Um, a lot of these farmers are super impoverished, so um, this is their, their life savings, and it's, it's pretty cool. Yeah. Um, will you talk us through <clears throat> excuse me, the anatomy of the bean? The anatomy so, of the bean. So the what, what is actually crushed and made into ah. cacao paste? So um, these little white seeds, which I'll leave this out here, um, these are cocoa beans seeds. Um, they become, everyone kind of gets tripped up on the, the lexicon, but um, these are seeds, otherwise known as cacao. Um, we call it cocoa beans once they come to us, once they are just about to go through the process. Um, but this white pulp is what they ferment in, and this is really crucial. Different beans have different fat content, so like Ecuador, tends to have a little bit of a lower fat content 
um, than, say, like uh, Madagascar or something. And that's just the varietal that's grown in these different countries of origin. Um, that doesn't necessarily impact the fermentation, but it impacts the end product when we're making chocolate because you're grinding it, as I said, when we first started. Um, so this white pulp is what it kind of sits in, as Donald said. Different countries ferment in different ways. Uh, West Africa typically does heap fermentation. So they'll chop the pod off the... the um, the tree trunk, then they'll slice it open, they'll pull the seeds out. Um, there's a really quick period of time before it starts to oxidize, so you throw it into a, um, in, as I said, in West Africa, they do heat fermentation, so they'll, it's a science that they've mastered, typically passed down for generations. Um, they'll put the beans in a heap, and then over the course of two to three days, they'll, um, they'll uh, turn them in on themselves. Um, it's actually like five to seven days, more or less, when they're fermenting. Um, and then in South America, they do what, um, what we call box fermentation. So it's cascading boxes. They'll start off at the top, then it's super ingenious. They open the, the, the front of the box, the um, fermented beans kind of turn in on themselves, and then they sit, they put banana leaves on top, then they sit in that box. And then a day later, they open it, and then they turn it. And you'll sometimes see on a farm, like a little chalkboard where they'll start like checking off how many days, what it is. These guys know their beans so well, they can like put their hand in and feel the heat. I'm still learning. <laughs> um, you can also tell whether it's been properly dried by the crunch of the shell on the seed. So that white pulp um, is what it ferments in, but then there's also like most seeds, like if you guys eat an apple, you know the brown husk sort of like comes off and you've got that, that slippery white seed inside. That's kind of what I could say is like the shell of like a cocoa pod or a cocoa seed. Um, and then after it's fermented, then you lay it out to dry, typically at a solar dryer. Um, and so that's sort of how that process works. And then we get it at the factory. And you are roasting it in South City? Where, where do you Oh, uh, We're roast based it? in Burlingame, so Burlingame. we had to move down there in 19, uh, like 50 is when they decided to build a freeway over our factory. But yeah, we roast um, and make, most of, our, most of our chocolate is sold on the wholesale side, so you don't really realize you're eating it. But um, you're, you're probably eating more guitar than you might realize. But um, it's sold in as an ingredient. And then um, we also have Consumer Line, which is out here. And then a lot, a lot of pastry chefs use this as well. I've, I've read like projections that um, growing demand for chocolate is starting to outstrip supply at a rather rapid rate on international markets. Is there any comment that you have on that? Um, yeah, I mean, it's principles of economics, supply yeah. and demand. Um, you know, I think you have to remember that cocoa is a commodity um, and it's it's an agricultural product at the, I don't want to say mercy, but it, um, you know, fluctuates, production fluctuates We based on mother nature. Um, we just had an El Nino season, which typically means that Africa's really, really dry, South America's really, really wet. Um, and those extremes, cocoa's a really delicate tree, which is why there's so much conversation around yields and planting material and how can you start planting more robust trees that can last longer in, in this extreme sort of weather. Um, we always believe that principles of economics will sort of iron things out. Um, it's always been the case. You look at the cocoa market and it's constantly fluctuating. So I think we'll have plenty of chocolate to um, go around for all. Brilliant. What, what is the addictive ingredient in chocolate? What would you say it is? Can you answer that question? Well, is it the theobromine? Theobromine, like, I, apparently, a little. There's a, it's a trace, trace, trace amount of caffeine in there, but that's not really why people, people. This, uh, it, it, there's something about chocolate that creates a sensation that you're in love, like it releases those sort of phenylalanine. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. What, what you said. Yeah. Well, we, yeah. we also talk about like taste has memory. That's one of the things we also yeah. have this concept of incremental degradation, which is my dad should trademark because talks about it all the time. But it's the idea where the things that you love slowly over time start to change flavor if you don't keep track of what it is. And we're talking about the importance of you know keeping flavor in mind when you're looking at planting material that's going in on the farms. The same thing happens when you're crafting chocolate. You know, you could be like, eh, I'm not gonna add like this bean today because we have like we have to you know do this. Over time if you continue to do that it'll incremental degradation. The base of the ch of the chocolate's gonna change. Um, and that idea of taste having memory, that chocolate that you had, you know, when you were a kid, if you taste that 
10 years later, 15 years later, it's going to bring you back to that moment when you had that first chocolate. And a lot of the stuff that we do, we've had in our repertoire for, you know, 150 years. Um, and other stuff is really new. And there's products that I smell or I taste and I'm just like brought back to that moment right then and there. So, um, yeah, whether it's theobromine or just your like soul, you know, I think that it's... Where do we go to get retail um, guitar? Yeah, so um, you can buy our stuff at uh, most premium supermarkets like Draeger's, Molly Stone's, Whole Foods carries it. Um, some of these items are pretty new, so uh, I always say like ask your retailers because they may not be aware of it um, or it might just be on its way. So, Can yeah. you order online? Uh, you can, limited amount, and the shipping cost is obscene because it's a delicate product. So, yeah. yeah. Okay. TBD. Can we please have the cake come out? It's just, it's just almost there. So okay. think about cakes. Let me just talk about cake real quick. So if you, you know, slam the door on a cake, uh, when, when the cake first starts to bake, um, there's, it's just basically air cells holding up the structure until the proteins and the starches um, coagulate, if you will, or set. Um, so if you open the door and, and shut it, the cake will collapse. Have any of you ever seen that before in a cake? Has it ever happened to anybody? Raise a hand. Yeah. yeah. So, so it's because it's not set yet. So this is where we are here. It's just about there. If I take it out now, we're going to have a little cave in in the middle. So how do I tell this done? It's spring back, actually. It's just like, you know, pushing on your forearm, springs back. Toothpick's okay. That'll that'll check moisture content. Um, it's, if it's real wet inside, it's not going to be. I, I'm I'm so familiar doing it. I just touch it with my hand. I kind of know. Like in time, it comes. You'll bake enough cakes. It'll happen. You know? um, checking the temperature with a the thermometer to see if it's done. Is that what you're asking? Um, you can. I I I have never. I never do that. For I I do that with other things, but not not with cake. Yeah. Really, it's just about the feel of it, how it, how it feels. And it, actually, if, if, we don't, if you want to, you can come by and just touch it when I put it on the table, and you can see kind of how it feels, if that, if that helps. Thank you both so much for just a delicious Thank afternoon. Sure. Thanks for having us.